Similar structures nearly always have similar plans, in this case DNA. Similar bridges have similar blueprints. This hardly constitutes evidence that one sired the other or that they were erected by tornadoes. So how people can be so blind as to not see that similarity does not prove a common ancestor, it could prove, or it does prove, a common designer. They're too complex. People have a pretty good understanding of how cars work. I've had 111 cars now as of this time. I've done just about everything you can do to a car. Rebuilt the motors, the transmissions, the differentials, the, you know, a lot of body work, stuff like that. I don't have time anymore, but I, I've done all that stuff. Started teaching my kids when they were a little bitty, you know. My daughter's water pump went out on her first car. Dad, my water pump's out. Would you fix it? No, ma'am. I'll help you fix it. She said, I'm a girl. I said, I know. What if it's going to break down in the middle of the country someplace? You better learn how this thing works. And so she changed the water pump. I mean, of all the things to learn working on a car, a water pump's a little tough to get at. You know, you've got to undo 14 other things to find the water pump and then change it. Well, she did it. I didn't touch it hardly. I just stood back and said, okay, now do this. See, this is in the way here. That's what you're trying to get to. If you thoroughly understood a car, if you did enough mechanic work, uh, Steve, you're going to be an airplane or jet pilot, you're probably going to have to understand those jets pretty well. Lots and lots of training on how they work. If you ever thoroughly understood everything on a jet, would that prove nobody designed it? No. You couldn't stand back and say, well, you know, because I understand it, therefore nobody made it. That is just flawed logic. See, if you understand how a machine operates, that has nothing to do with the origin of it. I understand the operation of a ballpoint pen. How the ink is in that little tube, you know, and the ball rolls around, and it uses all sorts of different physical factors to draw the ink down. You know, there's capillary action used in a ballpoint pen. Does that prove a ballpoint pen happened by chance? No, just because I understand it doesn't prove anything about the origin of it. And this is where some of these people get confused. They somehow think that operation and origin are related. So if I can understand how it works, that'll prove nobody made it. Uh, that's, that's, I don't know how they got there. I use the illustration, you know, if your kids turn 16, like my kids did. There's Ken Andrew on the camera there. He says, hey, Dad, I got my license. I want to borrow the car. I'd say, son, now listen, the car is a complex machine. There are 3,000 bolts required to hold a car together. And one nut can scatter it all over the highway <laughs> in a few seconds. I said, now, son, look, your mom and I have been praying about this. We don't think you understand how the car works yet, son. It's a very complex machine. And we don't think you're ready for the whole car this year. But this year, we decided we're going to let you have 10% of the car. Next year, maybe a little more, we'll let you evolve into the car piece by piece. What good is 10% of a car? It's worth nothing. You put them in a junkyard. Now, if you're going to study how cars work, it's pretty a good way to learn is by systems. Let's study the brake system. You push the pedal, it squeezes the master cylinder fluid, you know, goes down the tubes to the wheel cylinders, expands the calipers or whatever. Okay, you study the system. Then you study the electrical system or the fuel system or the whatever, okay? And you're probably going to learn jets that way. Here's this system. Uh, here is this system. And then how these systems integrate. You can study the human body that way. It's a great way to learn biology. Let's study the circulation system. Study the integumentary system, the skin. Okay. Study the nervous system. And then how do these systems relate to each other? But understanding the systems has nothing to do with the origin of it. And again, one thing missing from one of these systems may stop the whole thing from working. How many people have a very complex nervous system? They have a brain, spinal cord, nerves going to every cell in the body. But there's a broken place right at the base of the neck because they had a little car accident. Severed the nerve. Now they're sitting in a wheelchair. Nervous system's still there. One thing's broken. Stops the rest of it from working. Same thing true with any system. You know, the more complex they get, the more likely they are to break down, the more easy they are to have something go wrong. DNA sequences. This uh, fellow from uh, the annual, annual review of uh, ecology and systems uh, says, even with DNA sequence, we have no direct access to the process of evolution. So objective reconstruction of the vanished past can be achieved only by creative imagination. You have to imagine some kind of relationship based upon the sequence. 
people have argued about what I'm about to say here, but uh, about 1% of the human DNA has been determined. Others have said, no, no, the Human Genome Project, we've decoded the entire thing. Well, that's very deceitful to say that. Okay? To say we've decoded the human DNA is what, they, what they're saying is, we've taken this ladder that goes from here to Chicago, and we've got the A, B, C, D components figured out where they are. We've written the code down. Writing the code down in big blocks, you know, A, B, C, or D, does not explain, doesn't, doesn't mean you understand it. If I flew over, uh, let's say a, a Martian came in, there are no Martians or flying saucers, somebody will accuse me of believing in them. But let's say a Martian comes flying in, he flies over New York City, he looks down, he notices there are four basic kinds of vehicles. In New York City, you got one basic kind, taxi cabs, okay? But <laughs> we'll, we'll have to pick a different city. He's got, you know, you see buses. He sees uh, trucks, he sees motorcycles, he sees cars, and let's add a fifth one, bicycles, okay? Um, and he goes back to his uh, country or to his, uh, I, uh, his uh, planet and says, you know, I studied the different cities in America, and I found Cincinnati has a code, you know, it's got motorcycle, bus, truck, motorcycle, bus, truck, car, 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 bus. And I went to, you know, Dayton, Ohio, and they got uh, you know, different, slightly different sequence, you know, but 99% similar. That proves these two cities evolved from each other. No, oh, stop the music, you know. Is everybody that works around here a moron? You know, like, uh, like uh, who was it? Ernest said in that movie? Ernest P. Worrell. Um, this similarity would prove nothing as far as relationship or evolution. So actually, to say they've decoded the entire human genome is very deceitful. All they've done is figured out if it's a bus or a truck. They haven't figured out the complexity of that bus. They certainly don't have all the genes figured out in this sequence. So there are thousands of differences. Now, chimpanzees cannot put their little finger against their thumb. You have a muscle that allows you to pull your little finger. You can touch any of your fingers to your thumb. You, the muscles in their feet are different than your muscles in your feet. You cannot grab around a tree branch with your big toe on one side and your other toes on the other side. You can try it if you want, but I would recommend you pick a low branch to practice on because you're not going to hang there very long, right? But chimpanzees do it just fine, don't they? It's called a grasping foot. Now, that's great when you're climbing around through trees. It's not very good for running on the ground. Watch a chimpanzee's feet when it walks on the ground. They have to curl their toes under. They cannot walk flat-footed. They call them a knuckle walker. They walk on their knuckles. And it's very uncomfortable for them to walk on two feet for great distance. They can do it, but they kind of walk bow-legged, and their, feet, their feet are, toes are curled under Humans and chimpanzees have millions of differences. The bones, the muscles, the, the ratio of the length of the bones. Their arms, of course, are much longer compared to their body than humans are. Uh, you could, if you're looking for similarities, you can find them. You know, both have two eyes, same hair color in some cases. Sometimes, you know, some humans and chimpanzees both chew with their mouth open. That doesn't prove they're related to each other. The same designer created these things. And how they got to that stage of saying, you know, we're similar, therefore we're related, I don't understand. No, we're similar, therefore the same God designed us all. It's not that complex. Um, some people, though, say similarities proves relationships. So I did another spoof on this. I'll say, well, if you think similarity proves relationships, let's study the similarity of various objects in the world based upon their water content. Watermelons are, I mean, clouds are 100% water. One atheist said, no, they're not. There's air molecules in between. Okay, <laughs> you're missing the point, all right? I understand clouds have air in the middle of the water. But it's basically water in a cloud. Watermelons are 97% water. Only 3% difference. And jellyfish are 98% water. So here we have the missing link. And snow cones are also 98% water. So this proves that you know watermelons slowly evolved into either snow cones or jellyfish. I'm not sure which one. They're twins, you know. And then slowly evolved to a cloud, or vice versa. Arranging something in order does not prove any kind of similarity. It doesn't prove any relationship. Then the textbooks will say that fossils give evidence for evolution. This index to this one, this book has a whole chapter. I've seen some biology books that have an entire unit, you know, five or six chapters just on evolution. They want to make sure the kids believe that when they get out of school. This one says we have evidence from fossils. Well, let's just discuss this here. 
Is there any evidence from fossils to prove evolution? Suppose we're in a court of law. I stand up and I say, Your Honor, I, I can prove evolution. I can prove humans came from a monkey or an ape or an ape-like ancestor. And the judge says, Okay, what's your evidence, Mr. Hovind? And I'll say, Your Honor, I found this fossil in the ground buried in the dirt. And it has characteristics that are some human and some ape. The judge would say, or the opposing attorney would say, uh, Mr. Hovind, if you find a fossil in the ground, all you know is it died. You don't even know where it died. You know where it ended up getting buried, and that's all you know. You sure don't know that it had any kids. If you went to the cemetery and dug up a, uh, bones of a person, you would not be able to prove it had any children that lived. And you sure couldn't prove it had any different children. Darwin said, though, in his book, <clears throat> if my theory be true, that's an awfully big if, okay? He said, numberless intermediate varieties must have existed. Well, you're right. If you're going to change from a rock to a human, how many steps in between would you have to have? Each of them has to be able to live and move around and grow and reproduce and you know, survive in its environment. So if it can already live and survive in its environment, why is it going to change? They'll say, well, the environment changes, so it has to change. Okay, so you not only have to change the organism billions of times, you have to change the environment billions of times to make the organism want to change for some reason or be able to survive. Okay. David Ropp, who teaches uh, uh, or works at the museum, American Museum of Natural History in New York City, he's one of the guys at the museum, and he's a strong believer in evolution. He said, in the years after Darwin, his advocates, the people that promote him, hoped to find predictable progressions by that, you know, sequencing from apes to humans. You know, slightly bigger, slightly bigger, slightly bigger, slightly bigger. In general, these have not been found, yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Oh, you're kidding. Fantasy in our textbooks? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, there's fantasy in the textbooks. They dig up these fossils. Look, you don't know that it had any kids, and you sure don't know that it had different kids. Dogs today only produce dogs. If you observed dogs for, spent a lifetime, let's see, I think my daughter Marlissa, she's not here tonight, but she was with me in Ireland. We went to eat at a family's house. The guy raises some kind of, you know, prize dog. And he's real proud of these little dogs that he raises, you know. And he was all excited because his, one of his dogs was going to have puppies that day. And he's out driving me around to speak at, you know, some radio station. He said, oh, i got to get home. My wife called. She's having puppies. Oh, no, your wife's not having puppies. Your dog is having puppies. He was all flustered about this. He said, Brother Holman, you don't understand. These puppies are worth $1,000 a piece. I said, you're right. I don't understand. Who would pay $1,000 for, you know, that's only going to get this big when you're all done. You know, what's it going to do? Protect the house um, from the burglars. Now, Jan, your dog is a little more protection, right? What's that dog weigh now? 80 pounds. German Shepherd. Yeah, now that, I can see a use for that. But a chihuahua, I don't see any use for a chihuahua. You know, somebody goes to break into the house, yep, 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 whap, kick it clear into the next county, you know. <laughs> Your dog, I would not try to kick into the next county. I would turn around and run. Um, but dogs have only produced dogs. People that raise dogs will tell you. I had a lady tell me uh, oh, a couple months ago, she said, Mr. Oven, my family and my parents and grandparents, we've been involved in raising dogs for, I don't know, 60 years or whatever it was. She said, I sincerely believe that we could start with 50 generic mutts from the dog pound. You supply me 50 mutts. Go pick out the mongrel, any mongrel you want. We, with selective breeding, we will redevelop every breed of dog in the world today in less than 100 years. We could get a Great Dane and a Chihuahua and a St. Bernard and an Airedale and everything in between from 50 generic mutts in 100 years. Most breeds of dogs, if you stop and think about it, they were done by man for some particular reason. Somebody in Europe or England or something wanted to hunt weasels or groundhogs that go down in the hole in the ground. So they kept taking the puppies out of the litter that had the shortest legs. Pretty soon they developed a dachshund. Half a dog high, dog and a half long. He can run down the hole after, you know, 
whatever they're after. Um, dogs have different characteristics. Those character traits were already in the original gene code. You just select which one you want. Steve is, what, 6'2"? Becky, 5'7". When you guys have kids, they're going to be real tall. Eric, you were with me with the preacher in South Florida who taught us to shoot the rubber band. He was 6'8". His wife was 6'3". Remember the two daughters? The 13-year-old was already 6'3", daughter. The 15-year-old was 6'5". Both of them still growing like mad. This is in Orlando, I think, or something like that. Traits are inherited. My wife is 5'0". I'm 6'1". If I had married somebody taller, my kids would probably be taller. Sorry about that, boys. <laughs> She's the one I picked, and you get to pick yours, too. Uh, it was your problem how tall you came out. You can live with that. My brothers are 6'3", and they both married taller women, and their kids are much taller. It's just, but they're still human. Dogs produce dogs. That's all you're ever going to get. So why would anybody think that after observing dogs producing dogs for several thousand years of human history, what would make anybody conclude that sometime long ago and far away, dogs came from something that was non-dog? What justification would you have for that conclusion? There's no observable evidence for it. There are genetic barriers to keep it from happening. You know, dogs have 78 chromosomes. Adding or losing chromosomes is normally fatal or certainly harmful, like with humans. So doubling the chromosome number, we'll get into that later, uh, the, uh, polyploidy, doesn't add any new information. Okay, you get those giant strawberries you buy at the store, you know, that they, it's polyploidy. They've doubled the chromosome number. Now, they taste horrible, generally. They don't taste near as good as the regular little tiny strawberries. But they say, wow, look at this giant strawberry. This is proof for evolution. Well, today, no, you simply doubled the chromosome number. You haven't added any new information at all. Luther Sunderland uh, was studying evolution and wanted to find out where the evidence is. So he visited major museums around the world or wrote to major professors who believe in evolution and asked them, what evidence do you have? They would write back or when he talked to them face to face, they would say, well, we don't have any evidence, but, you know, somebody else has it. They all think somebody else has the evidence. When he contacted Colin Patterson, Colin Patterson is the, uh, one of the curators, the directors of the, Ameri of the British Museum of Natural History. I believe it's in London or near there. They have the largest fossil collection in the world. Nobody has more fossils than the British Museum of Natural History. Display rooms and case after case after case of fossils on display that they've mounted and you know, put up for display. Colin Patterson, the director of this museum, wrote a book about evolution. Wrote how he believes in evolution, how this animal changed to this animal. Well, Luther Sunderland read the book and noticed he told us about evolution, but he never showed us any examples. He never showed us the fossil of the missing link. And there'd have to be zillions of these. He said, Mr. Patterson, where are the missing links? I read your book. Why didn't you show us a picture of one? Colin Patterson wrote back a very interesting confession, and he has since been uh, uh, chided for it many times, I'm sure. Patterson wrote back and said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any. You got the biggest fossil collection in the world and you don't know of any missing links? He said, if I knew of any, fossil or living. Now that's an interesting confession. If it's living, how can it be a missing link? Even if it's alive, I would have put it in my book. That's deceitful, okay. He said, if I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. And he goes on to say, for which one can make an airtight or watertight case. If evolution had to be proven in a court of law, it would fail in the first round. Wouldn't make it to the appellate court or the circuit court or Supreme Court. It would fail in the local court. A freshman law student out of Podunk College could say, Your Honor, <laughs> he doesn't have any evidence for evolution. It would be so easy to defeat this if evolution had to be proven in a court of law. But it doesn't have to be proven in a court of law. Evolution has to only sound convincing to the students going through high school. And that's where the problem comes in, my opinion. Folks, there aren't any missing links. The whole chain is missing. Guys like Stephen Gould, the communist professor at Harvard University, says the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages has been a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. I sent a set of my videotapes to Stephen Gould. 
when I went to Harvard, uh, ten years, eight, eight years ago, I guess I went up there to preach in the area, six, seven, eight years ago. I went to visit Harvard after I went to go see Stephen Gould. He wasn't there that day. But I went and met his secretary, a very nice lady. My tapes were sitting on his shelf in his office. I was so proud of myself. Wow. Hope he's watched them. Okay. Steve, watch them. Okay. I want to get you converted. You'll make a great Christian when we get you saved. All right. Let's give an analogy to understand. Uh, and all analogies break down at some point. Okay. But to help people understand a little bit, let's make an English sentence here. The quick... Brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Do you use that sentence in your English class, Jan? Not yet. Not yet. You teach English as a second language. This sentence contains every letter of the alphabet. All 26 letters are found in that one sentence. And now you're going to not listen to a thing I say. You're going to sit there and study the sentence. So <laughs> uh, it does. Trust me, okay? The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. I could analyze these. Suppose this was Chinese or, you know, Arabic. And I didn't understand anything. This just, to me, it's just a bunch of chalk on a, on a chalkboard, okay? Which is what Arabic looks like to me, a bunch of circles, you know? I don't understand. But they read it. Oh, yeah, it says right here. You know? <laughs> or Hebrew, you know? How confusing can you get? Or Russian. But... Uh, Suppose I was going to analyze this, just as an outsider who knows nothing about English. I would say, you know, some of these letters are rounded. They have kind of round shapes to them. So we're going to classify them as rounded or squared. Could I classify letters of the English alphabet as rounded or squared and group them? The Q is, would be a rounded one. The O is rounded. The U is rounded. Then I get, now the U actually is more complex. It has part rounded, part squared. So then we're going to have combination. Now the combination letters, the U is a confusing one because the squared part is at the top. The rounded part is at the bottom. Others have the rounded part at the bottom and the squared part or the, at the top, like the P. This has the, the round part at the top and the square part at the bottom. So we'll have combination one and combination two. I have basically four different types of letters in the English alphabet. That's kind of what they've done with the DNA sequencing. I could say, well, look at this sequence. We have, for this sentence, the quick brown fox. We have square, 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 round, combination one, square, round, so I can go through and give these a code, S, 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 R, C1, S, R, C2. Does that mean anything? Who cares, okay? That's what they've done with the protein. The DNA sequence, they have said, oh, this is an A, B, C, D. I should look, should look up this, the four letters, uh, the different uh, components of the DNA. I'll get, somebody will blast me for this, I'm sure, but I taught this years ago, and I just forgot at the moment. Um, this would, who cares? Okay? And I could compare this sentence to another sentence and probably find another sentence with a very similar sequence of letters. So, doesn't mean a thing. And the fact that there are some similarities of the proteins and similarities of sequences, it doesn't mean a thing. It has nothing to do with evolution. I've done 55 debates at this time against evolutionists. Okay? I'm willing to do any more, any time. I did one uh, in Ohio University, Athens, Ohio, oh, four months ago, I guess. There was two professors against me, two on one. Uh, I just read on the Internet last week, one of the professors wrote about his experience debating a creationist, you know. What was it like? Did you read that, Eric? About... Yeah, we watched the, the videotape. didn't turn out very well. The audio was lousy. I wish we could use that because it was, it was really a good debate. But he was uh, whining on the... Uh, uh, internet on his website about how that you know it's unfair to debate creationists because you know they're professional debaters I've never had a debate class in my life okay all I know is I'm right he's wrong <laughs> very easy to win a debate when you're confident like that so I, I emailed him back uh, three days ago I haven't checked my email uh, yet today yet to find out if I got an answer I said 
because he said in, in his in his long diatribe about why you shouldn't debate creationists, he says you can't be, you, nobody can possibly be trained in all of the different areas they will bring up. You know, you'd have to be a geologist and a biologist and a, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, I hereby challenge your entire science department. I will debate all the teachers in your entire university at the same time. On the condition, it's equal time for each position, not each person. If there's 20 of you and one of me, I want half of the time. That's fair. That way, if I ask if we get into a topic that deals with biology, have your biology teacher answer it. When I debated uh, Pigliucci at uh, University Knoxville, University of Tennessee in Knoxville, he is a botany prof assistant professor, associate professor. His PhD is in botany, the study of plants. I said, Mr. Pigliucci, what is your best evidence for evolution? What's the best evidence you know of? He said, the fossil record. Now hold it. You're teaching botany. Why do you think the best evidence is over in some other department? Paleontology. I said, the fossil record of what? He said, the fossil record for the evolution of whales is the best evidence we have. Now think about it. Here's a PhD in botany thinking the evidence for evolution is over in anthropology department. But if you go to the anthropologists and say, where's the evidence for evolution? They'll say, oh, they've got it in the biology department. Ask the biologist, where's the evidence? Oh, the anthropologists have it. Or the geologists have it. Everybody thinks somebody else has the evidence. It's a shell game. You ever see those things at the carnival where they get three shells and they tell you to put a pea under there, you know, and the guy tries to get you confused, you know, switching them around? Evolution is a shell game. Each person thinks the pea is under a different one. There is no pea under any of them. Nobody has the evidence. Nobody has ever found any evidence for evolution. That's why about 10 years ago in our ministry we said, look, started off, I guess 12 years ago, I wrote, wrote a letter to the editor in the local paper here, and I said, I will pay $1,000 for any evidence for evolution. A lawyer friend of mine a couple of months later said, hey, Mr. Oven, let's make it $10,000. i will back you up. I said, $10,000? He said, yeah, it's nothing for me. i got plenty. I said, okay. <laughs> we made the offer $10,000. Then a friend of mine from... Uh, now, Oregon called me and said, hey, Bill Hovind, let's make it a quarter million. I'll back you up. I'll keep the money in a special account. One quarter million dollars. I can't imagine having a quarter million just to sit around in, a, in an account someplace. <laughs> he said, I'll back you up. So we put all kinds of publishing out there. We'll put a quarter million dollars for evidence for evolution. He called me uh, about a year later and said, hey, let's make it a million. I said, let's keep it at a quarter million. Okay, I've got so much stuff printed that says a quarter million. I don't want to go back and reprint everything. You could offer any amount of evidence, any amount of money. for the. There is no evidence. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog, let alone, let alone a dog come from a banana. But if you can ever get the evolutionists to see clearly what it is they believe, and I've never had one admit this, but they do believe dogs and bananas have a common ancestor, and the ancestor was a rock. If you boil it down, that's what you get to. They don't see it. I think what's happened here. We have a Romans chapter 1 situation. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them up to vain imaginations. The Bible says God will send them strong delusion. You have to be deluded to think we came from a rock. Now, if you want to believe that, that's fine. But that's not logical. It's not scientific. And that's certainly not going to help you when you stand before God one day. Some people are going to get before God and say, Well, I studied the evidence and I believed in evolution. You had to want to believe that. A logical thinking person won't come to that conclusion from studying the evidence. When you look at a complex thing like a watch, I would come to the conclusion, somebody made this. I don't know who he is. Doesn't matter. I don't know where he lives. I probably never meet him. I don't have to meet him. I believe he exists, or at least did exist. I've seen what he did. The painting is proof of the painter. <clears throat> the object is proof of the designer. That's all you need. I could probably learn, I could probably analyze a few things about, I could tell you a few things about the guy that made this watch. Even though I don't know, have a, never met him, probably never will. Probably speaks Japanese, lives in Japan apparently. 
I would say he's a logical thinker. He's got the numbers in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. He must think logically. I could probably deduce a few character traits. He must be patient, able to put them little bitty things on there. Must be uh, precise. Must be very smart. He must have a good knowledge of electronics. He must have a good knowledge of different materials. He knows certain plastics can be used certain places, but they couldn't be used other places. You wouldn't want to use plastic in the watch band. How long would that last? You can use it for the buttons. He has a knowledge of quite a few things, a knowledge of materials. Never met the guy, but I can already tell you a few things about him. I've never met God, but I can tell you a few things about him. He's real smart. He's patient. He's loving. Just by seeing the creation, I can determine some things about the Creator. And that's the way it ought to be.